gentlemen, we're still here. The Commodores in still in my background. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. This video is going to be in line with the last few videos that have been done. We were talking about judges and other public officials who just failed to do their job. Now, I want you guys to focus on something. They're called public officials. They're called public servants. Now, the word servant implies a fiduciary position, means they don't have the right to rule. So why do judges make rulings? Go back and take a look. They talk about, I made a ruling. Excuse me? Who gave you the right to rule over anybody? Now, look, ladies and gentlemen, like what every last one of you I am required to obey the, pay attention to the word, superior authorities. Okay? But in the United States, aren't the people said to be the superior authority? In the United States, aren't the public servants supposed to be in service to the public? Not the individual. No, 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 no. I don't want nobody serving me ever. I don't need servants. I don't need to rule over somebody to feel like I is important. Or should I say the correct word, important, okay? I don't need that. But there are a lot of people who are not understanding that there is a different system than the one we were told we were under. You see, they call themselves public servants. They say they have a fiduciary duty, and yet they don't act like they're public servants. They, I literally have had a judge just going to let you guys know, says that we have never responded, yet there are 256 documents in the record. But he said that we never responded. And then, as one of the outstanding motions, it's an affidavit challenging their presumptions of presumptions. And he puts that in his so-called order. But he said we never responded. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, um, let me use this exact words because he and other judges use the same phrase. In a meaningful manner. Excuse me? In a meaningful manner. Then where is the law that says somebody has to respond in a meaningful manner? See, in a meaningful manner, is a legal phrase, terminology, legal term. It means that it's not to their satisfaction. Why? Because we're challenging their jurisdiction. We're raising questions. They don't want those questions on the record, so what they do is they claim that nobody ever responded. Interesting, ain't it? This very same judge says there are no challenges on the record and jurisdiction has been established. Excuse me? <laughs> we challenged jurisdiction from the get-go. By the way, once jurisdiction is challenged, it must be proved. And so even if he claims that we've never responded, our challenge to jurisdiction gets around all of that stupidity because he gets no jurisdiction until he proves jurisdiction. Now he'll say, well, I proved it. No, you ain't proved nothing, but you'll say it. Look, ladies and gentlemen, they say a whole lot of things. Need y'all to understand. They say a whole lot of things. We're not looking for them to say anything. We don't care about what they say. We're not asking them to say anything. We're asking for them to prove everything. Why? Because the burden of proof is not on us. It's on them. Well, they're ignoring the burden of proof principle. They're ignoring the burden of proof principle because they can they're saying they have every right to do that and i say oh well i literally say oh well so we with that particular judge we're going to file our complaint with the judge and we're going to file our complaint with our appeal because they're his superiors 
and we're going to file our complaint. We're going to see if these individuals are going to be complacent in his actions. Now, he is doing the same thing as the judge before him because we got the judge before him recused, and he's carrying on the same mandate. See, we got the judge to recuse himself. No, the judge is going to say he voluntarily recused himself. No, we brought several complaints against that particular fiduciary. And, oh, well, this is the game they play, ladies and gentlemen. You, you, you must understand, when they play games, these are the type of games that they usually, usually find themselves playing. And sometimes we, we engage in such an arena. Not always, but sometimes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to continue our music in the background. And as we continue, there is blue magic. And many of y'all know of Blue Magic. What we're going to do is we're going to go over these style manuals. Now, this is going to be on the website shortly. Okay, as a matter of fact, before this video is uploaded, this information will be on the website. We have the FJC, the Federal Judicial Council Law Clerk Handbook. Then we got Freddie Mac Mortgage Participation Certificate. And then we also got the Mortgage Participation Certificate, COP, Certificate of Participation. Okay. Then we have the Style Manual Interim. And then we have the Style Manual. And then we have the Supreme Court Style Manual. What I've done is I've taken all these documents and I combined them into this PDF. Okay. Law Clerk. Handbook for Law Clerks to Federal Judges. You mean Law Clerks? The Clerks of the Law? They, they got law clerks and the federal judges have their own. Oh, the Federal Judicial Center. That's interesting. The Federal Judicial Center publication was undertaken in the furtherance of the center's statutory mission. Look at that. They're only there by statute because they're not judiciary. They're not judges. Okay. To develop educational material for the judicial branch. Sorry. Sorry. They said for the judicial branch? Anyway. While the Senate regards the contents as responsible and valuable, it does not reflect policy and recommendation of the board of the Federal Judicial Center. Ladies and gentlemen, they call themselves the Federal Judicial Center, but they're a private corporation. They were created by statute. Now, what you guys must understand, Congress has no authority to create new rules for the judiciary. They never did. See, once the judiciary was created by the Judiciary Act, then Congress lost the ability to create further rules for them. The only ones who could do so were them, just like the President of the United States. Congress can't create new rules for the executive branch. That's why the executive branch created their own new rule. It's called Presidential Proclamation 2039. Go on, take a look. And in order for them to create the new rule, all they did was piggyback on the statute, which was the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, the Trading with the Enemies Act was technically legal because Congress has the authority to declare war, not the president. Go ahead. Only Congress has the authority to declare war. So what did Congress do? They didn't play a card game. I declare war. No, what Congress said is, hey, foreign affairs, because military action can only be for protection against invasion. So we're going to create this thing called the so-called Trading with the Enemies Act. Yeah, we're going to call it trading with the enemy. Ooh, because it's going to make it sound so much, 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 much more ominous. And we're going to create that act and we're going to make the citizens of the United States, we're going to make them enemies. Go back and look at the act. Go back and look at how the banking holiday was against the people withdrawing their monies from the bank. It had nothing to do with the actual withdrawing of money from the bank or making a run on the bank. No, it was against the people withdrawing their money from the bank. Interesting, ain't it? Yeah, I thought you would figure that way. Okay. Now, Congress had every right to enact that act. So what the president did through the banks, because this was a um, plan to begin with, is the president said, hey, we got an emergency and I want to use the provisions of the Trading with the Enemies Act in order to enact this. Congress said, hey, you know what? They ain't never seen nothing like that before. We didn't envision that. 
technically we did, but we didn't envision that. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new act. Yeah, because, you know, the old act was, you know, dull and people got so used to seeing us. It's, it was like Hamilton. Everybody's seen it by now. Talking about can't get tickets. Nobody cares about it anymore. So we got to create a new act. And they did. They amended the first act. New cast, new crews. And it was called the March 9, 1933 Act, or the Amendment to the Trading with the Enemies Act. Now, what I want to do in this, okay, because we need to look for something. So we're going to do Control F, and we're going to just put names. No, we're going to put caption. Okay, I'm putting the word caption. What is a caption? Oh, it's that thing at the very bottom of the video where it shows you the names. Okay. The local rules of court and standard litigation practice usually leads the lawyers who files a class action to indicate its nature by a caption on the first page of the complaint. So the caption appears on the first page of the complaint. That's the first thing you need to know. There's a Federal Rules of Procedure 23G. Okay, but we don't care about 23G or 23C because that's the 23C, 23G. We don't care about Rule 23. That's not our issue. Watch this. Docket numbers, a short caption of the case, and the names of the members of the panel. Okay, we're, we're getting somewhere. We got caption again. Um, look at that. The caption of the case with the names of the parties and the descriptive title indicating the nature of the order. There we go. We're, we're, we're getting... Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That is the caption of the case. Okay? The caption of the case includes the names of the parties. It includes a descriptive title indicating the nature of the order. So that little box that you see everybody's name in at the top of a motion or in the top of an order, that's called the caption. Usually includes the name of the court, the docket number of the case. That's what a caption is. Here's the only problem, ladies and gentlemen. The clerk style manual says that it is to be in all capital letters. You know, I was, um, when I was receiving Social Security and applying for Social Security in 2008, <clears throat> Excuse me. As I was applying for Social Security in 2008, and they had just diagnosed, um, after running a simple blood test, muscular dystrophy and myasthenia gravis, which I'm so glad I have a slight form of myasthenia, but muscular dystrophy and the two combinations, they believe that the two are competing against each other. And when they were diagnosing that, I went to a particular medical facility in New Mexico. And this medical facility was in putting my name into the computer. Now, many of you are aware that I changed my name in 1999 and made it 10 names long. And as I stated, my intent for doing that was that I could be 100 different people at one time, and nobody could say anything about it. See, I could take those names 10 times 10, multiply those names, change them around, mix them around, spin them around, and I could be whatever. And no one could say anything. I was just showing how stupid the system was. Well, then, eh, got tired. That was a little game but anyway when i did that my name was so long that they couldn't even put it in the computer and as the doctor is giving the nurse who's putting it in the computer in the computer he told her and remember you must put the name in all capital letters this exact words he didn't know who i was this was 2008 i hadn't done any videos y'all he didn't know who i was i didn't start doing videos until 2009 2010 he had no clue as to who I was, but he told the nurse, you remember, you must put the name in all capital letters. I knew about the all capital letter issue. I had already been arguing that in certain cases in a different state, not that state. I hadn't even filed a case in that state with the exception of Social Security. I knew about the Social Security card. 
But I remembered that statement and I didn't question them that on that. I didn't say, excuse me, why does it need to be in all capital letters? That's not how I spell my name. I didn't do any of that. Let's continue. All principal words are capitalized in titles of addresses, albums, articles, books, captions, captions, captions. All principal words in captions are capitalized. Chapters and part headings, editorials, essays, headings, headlines, motion pictures, and plays, including television and radio programs, papers, short poems, reports, songs, subheadings, subjects, and themes. The foregoing are also quoted. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I need for you to understand something. I'm not too concerned about all of this junk here. Uh, it might be interesting for some of you, okay? Uh, that's why we're going to put the documents up for you guys to take a look, okay? In short or popular titles of acts, federal, state, and foreign, the first words and all important words are capitalized. It didn't say the first letter of each word. It said the words are capitalized. And remember, it's called a caption. Capital shun. Capitalize. Oh, you don't think there's a coincidence that it starts with the same syllable? Of course there's a coincidence. That's why they call it a caption. Go ahead and pay attention to the closed caption at the bottom of your screen while you're watching TV. They call it a caption for a reason. But remember, it's not at the bottom of any screen. It is the thing which carries your name, and it is all capitalized. Now, in closed titles, addresses, albums, articles, and books, capit capitations, Captations, cap, captations, editorials, essays, headings, headlines, headings, headlines, headings, headlines, hearings, motion pictures. <clears throat> Let's do that again. Hearings, motion, hearing, or motion hearings and pictures and plays. Motion, hearings, motions, hearings, motions. Oh, look at that. They added the word pictures. Isn't that interesting? Papers, short poems, report songs, blah, 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 blah. All principal words are to be capitalized. Under the caption, long-term treasury rise. Aw, they caption every word as opposed to all caps. Have you noticed we haven't seen all caps yet? All block capitals? Let's continue. Yeah, we're still with that uh, capitalized principal words quotes thereafter because it's another book, but I am looking for the actual caption caption. Except that the caption uses between and instead of verses. So when you hear of parties, this party against that party, it sometimes it'll say, between this party and this party, or sometimes we'll say this party versus that party. Uh, and, and what you guys to understand, our arbitrations, I didn't know that this, I saw arbitration, but I was looking past it because I wasn't caring about it. But our arbitration documents talk about between parties. Sometimes we use this versus as well. Arbitration opinions should be cited like court opinions when adversary parties are named. Okay. Now, look, this is their style manual, but they don't control arbitration. They never did. Arbitration is not under court rules. <clears throat> Pay attention. Arbitration is not under court rules. Arbitration is under arbitration rules. Not under court rules. The courts have no say-so over arbitration. Formal case captions. So we're going to go on through these captions because I think this will give us what we're needing. Part two, the style guide provides direction on certain aspects of style used in Supreme Court opinions. Subjects covered include capitalizations, punctuations, use of footnotes and headings, captions, and commonly misused words. 
ladies and gentlemen, part two of the style guide, the style guide, the style guide. It's called the court style manual. Part two of this guide explains and it covers subjects like capitalization. Now, why would it have to cover the subject of capitalization? Because they created new meanings for things. That's why they're called legal terminologies, legal terms, legal captions. You see the word legal, whenever you see the word legal, legal means statutory. They created some special rule. Legal means statutory. One second. Sorry, I had to cough because I got allergies early in the morning. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, legal means statutory. Lawful means common law. Go ahead and see how often the courts use the word or phrase lawful. Matter of fact, we might actually do that word next, but we're going to continue a caption because caption is so important. Oh, you didn't understand that? These are the style manuals, many of the style manuals. And notice, name of states are not abbreviated in case caption. Did you see that? The name of the state, like right here, it's not abbreviated in the caption. Spelled all out, but it's always in all capitals. Imagine that. One more time. Yeah, they say it's cottonwood and ragweed or something like that. Weed? Ragweed. Short form citations. Short form citations are used when a source of cite is cited more than once. The full cite is given when the source is first cited and the short form thereafter. The short form generally uses a few identifying words from the full caption. These or excuse me, there is no strict rule how much of the caption to leave out of the dis is discretionary. The writer may decide to use only the plaintiff's name or the whole caption as a short form. Okay? Now, remember, you're, you're trying to not prove, but you're trying to show that the practice is to take the name and all capitalize it. Abbreviated and formal case caption, the administrator. Now you notice, oh, do not use administratrix. Uh-oh, abbreviated and formal case caption, also known as. Okay, these are their abbreviations. Okay, these are their abbreviations. You've seen that before, Attorney General. And I noticed that when I'm using my voice recognition, look at this, all capitalized here, but they haven't all capitalized anything down here. Now that's interesting, ain't it? When I'm using voice recognition, it takes certain words like court and it lower cases it. Well, we know that court is not a non-person, non-place, non-thing. So why do they not capitalize it? That doesn't make any sense to me. And when I say it doesn't make any sense to me, uh-oh, I think I may have gone too far. Section 14, the case caption. Whew, this is where we're going. We're almost there, y'all. Wait a minute. Okay. The former case caption was taken from the original pleading in the case, whether it is a complaint in a trial court or a petition for a writ in the court of appeals or an original action in this court. Thus, the name of the parties who has long since dropped out of the litigation may well appear in the caption. Names of juveniles are to be treated in the accordance with E, reference to juveniles, under 14.4 miscellaneous caption matters below. The following rules apply to formal captions. The formal caption line appears in large and small capital letters in bold types. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me clear my, vo my throat. <clears> throat. The formal caption line appears in large and small capital letters in bold type. The V is italicized and is lowercase, not a small capital letter. Wait, why can't the V be a small capital letter. 
The first names are omitted. To determine the correct form of caption of the case, go to the original complaint and to later amend the complaint if it substitutes a party, whether filed in the trial court or a government agency or a court of appeals or here, follow the order of names as they are listed in the pleading. Okay, but notice this. Consider a pleading that is captioned as followed. You see these names here? They're not all capitalized. But this says that they're supposed to be all capitalized. We just read that. Pay attention. Small capital letters. So this example is not what they just told us that they were going to be following. Like we told you, we and this is for the Supreme Court of the state of Ohio. These are their rules. Well, ladies and gentlemen, no, 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 no. They can't do that. Who told them that they get to take and make the name all capitals? Okay, who who said that? Sorry, that's um and I'm I'm gonna stop using this and I'm gonna go back to Spotify. Um, because Spotify, even though it is not as free as I want it to be, I can still play music without commercials. There are a couple others, but right now I don't need no suggestions. Y'all, y'all all right? Okay, good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, remember all cap portalizations here. Who said that they get to do that? Who said that they get to render your name in all capitals? Nobody asks you for permission and how to render your name. This is how they want to render your name. They created a rule, but not a law. You guys understand, this is their style manual. They created this. Cite as line. In the former case caption, the first defendant listed in the original pleading is always the first to appear after the V. The cite as line, the first defendant is the only name to appear after the V, even if the party has long ago disappeared from the litigation and has filed nothing with this court. Thus, for all of the examples in 14.1, the formal case caption above is cited as line, or cite as line would read, cite as line, because they're citing a case. Okay, then we got how to file a cite as line. Okay, this is how the case is cited as. That's how they do the short title at the top of the motion. But now you do know that they have a rule where the name is supposed to be all capitalized. Now you do know that they have a rule that the name is to be all capitalized. That's why we are putting the court style manual up there. Now, let me ask you a question. In all of these documents, why are they so focused on the caption? Oh, sorry. Like I said, you think that they are playing around with this word right here. Capitalization? Let's see if they're focused on capitalization. We're going to go here. We want to know, <clears throat> no, we're going to do legal. So we're going to go here in grammar because you know what we're going to do. We're going to find out what English grammar. Capitalization in the writings of a word is with the first letter in uppercase and the remaining letters in lowercase. That's called capitalization. Now, let's do because it's not grammar if it's legal. Whoa, we got rule of capitalization. So let's go rule of capitalization. Capitalization rules. Check for proper capitalization, other common grammatical errors. No, no, okay, this is giving us um, that type of rules. Yeah, see, capitalized names and proper nouns. A court is a proper noun. Even if it was a 
pronoun, but it's not. But even if it was a pronoun, it would still be capitalized. Okay, these are the rules in English, but the courts don't speak English. The courts speak a foreign language known as legalese. So we're not going to go with the rules of capitalization. We're going to go with the legal. Watch. L-E-G-A-L. -E legal definition. Some of you, this is not interesting, but many of you, this is, man, I've been looking for that. We finally got it. The act of counting anticipated earnings and expenses as capital assets. Uh -uh. I said legal definition. Nobody's talking about capital assets. Capitalization. Okay, let's do this. I know we got... Okay, name, title, don't want name, title, name, style, capitalization. Let's do style because we were doing the court style manual. So let's do style. Use sentence style capitalization in most titles and headings. Capitalize the first word and lowercase the rest. No, that's not what we're looking for. That's Microsoft style guide. How come everybody's got their own style guide? APA. Now, this is the Administrative Procedures Act. At least I think it is. The pronunciation manual contains guidance for capitalization of words. I don't, I don't know if this is the APA, but I do know that as you see, there are many style guides and we already have this one. Okay, but we're gonna go here in just a second, but we're gonna go here first because I am interested because if it's the APA, look, the entire United States is an administrative country, administratively run country. Because the U.S. is an administratively run country, we need to understand, okay, the punctuation manual contains guidance on how to capitalize words beginning a sentence, proper nouns, trade names, job titles, positions, disease, disorders, therapies, theories, and related terms, titles of works and headings of written in works, titles of tests and measures, nouns followed by numeral or letters, names of conditions or groups and experiments. Uh, okay. And common questions. That's not what I'm looking for. No, nah, that's not what I'm looking for, Chief. Dana Dane. Send the fella. Okay. That's not what we're looking for. So we're going to leave that alone for now because that's not what we're looking for. Like we say, we're going to go to this one again. And I'll download this one too. I, like I said, I think I already has it. But just in case I don't, I'm going to add it to the list. It will be up on the site and it will be under clerk style manual. That will be the name. That will be the day. Okay, capitalization rules. It is important to give rules that may cover every conceivable problem in capitalization. But and remember, there's a problem with capitalization. There's a problem with capitalization. Every conceivable problem in capitalization. But by considering the purpose to be served and the underlying principles, it is possible to attain a considerable degree of uniformity. The list of approved forms given in Chapter 4 will serve as a guide. Obviously, such a list cannot be complete. The correct usage with respect to any term not included can be determined by analogy or application of the rule. Ladies and gentlemen, this is chapter three. Okay, this is chapter three. Then they got capitalization examples in number four. I don't know which book this is. And so let's see if we can find out. This is the GPO style manual, 2008. So we're going to download this GPO style manual. Let's see. I'm looking for, because it may not give me a title, so I'm looking for a title. I'm looking for a title. And 
go back and look at the word. This thing says proper nouns capitalized. You'll see that the courts don't operate under the same guidance and or rules. Why? Because the courts don't have proper nouns being capitalized. So we're going to do, even though this is not the proper title, we're going to use this because it's the best one instead of me having to type everything in and come up with my own idea of what it should be. And this document, let's go ahead and add some power to the mix because right now my battery is getting low. Oh no, we'll, we'll do this. We'll do the GPL style manual. We don't have to add all the other stuff. We can, we can do that. And we're going to put it in the clerk style manual. That's the title of the um dag nabbit it's already here this is 2016 this is 2008 the one that we're looking at is 2008 so we're going to keep both the 2008 and the 2016 in here i i thought i had downloaded this before so let's see if we can get the gpo style manual the complete style manual and then i'm going to go in here and i'm going to look at this style manual and see the size and difference this is 1100 kilobytes let's see we got 2016 i labeled it as 2018 i don't think i was planning on labeling it 2018 yeah 654 a.m that's what time it is, y'all. Wake up in the morning doing this. Go to sleep at night doing this. So 2008, not 2016. So we got both of these. And so I believe the 2016 might be the whole manual because it's 4,000, okay, um, kilobytes. Now, you see, written style guide. I'm going to also include this because this is from the University of Arizona. Or is it not Nevada? Nevada. And so I'm going to include this in that for the research of those who are interested in capitalization. We all know that when they put your name in all caps, it's not so much they're calling you a capital uh, corporation. When they put your name in all caps, what they're doing is they're now changing your capacity in the court. See, they need a subject without you allowing them to change. Okay, this is capitalization. I can't put this in unless I create a document. So what I'm gonna suggest is that those of you who are interested, go here. But this is only for the written style guide. Capitalize, capitalize only when necessary. The more words you capitalize, the more you complicate your text. The more words you capitalize, the more ways you complicate your text. Uh, lowercase informal names, lowercase. Nobody's asking about lowercase. Academic and administrative titles, nobody cares. And you notice how they capitalize every other word. I refer to it as upper, uh, uppercase caps. Okay. And, or excuse me, lowercase caps, sorry. I refer to it as lowercase caps, not uppercase cap. That's me moving too fast. Okay. What I don't see is I don't see all capitals here. And I don't feel like going through the whole document because, again, this video was to bring this information to you all's attention. Not so much to cover every aspect of capitalization. Okay. Some people have been looking for it, but they didn't know how to look for it. So they were doing all capitalized and all that. Now, watch this. We're going to do. Get rid of capitalization. And. We're going to do. All cap meaning because I want the original um, definition. I don't care about the straw man, but I'm looking for the Latin communication, which talked about capitalization, how they capitalize on the person.
and it hey boris y'all i've been wondering whatever happened to boris i ain't heard of boris in a while nobody's mentioned nothing to boris i'm interested in boris i'm anxious to find out what's going on with the young man here is what i'm looking for right here ladies and gentlemen this is what i'm looking for and look up it's all the way at the bottom and it should have been at the very top should have been one of the first things that was here because this is the latin meaning meaning that the current supreme court did not get their style manual information from this oh i'm in the wrong section i'm supposed to be up here capitus dominus meaning to dominate maxima means it's a maxim taking full control okay let's see i'm looking for the actual definition i don't care about scribd scribd did 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 but i will go to legal dictionary this is uslegal.com they give definitions and this is their job so because they have a reputation for such information i will go to them uh oh nobody asked you for legal forms i'm asking for this information let's get down to the nitty-gritty okay this is the legal definition for capitalization literally means diminishing of a person's personality or status a person may lose his personality or legal capacity, either in whole or part. Ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you it's all about capacity, when I tell you it's all about trust, I'm not just saying words. I'm letting you know that this is what they have done. So what we'll do is we'll create this document, and then you will take what's in the style manual, and you will document that. You will document that this is from US Legal, dot com for the definition doesn't matter you can go any other place and get the definition for this principle it literally is to take control so when i say that they're changing your capacity from you being not a sovereign because you're not a sovereign as a single person but from you being one of the people and the people are sovereign the people as a group are sovereign not one of them. So the majority are the sovereign. The individual is not. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Why do you think they have that phrase? Ladies and gentlemen, why do you think, why do you think, why do you think? We're going to do, you know, let's get some style to our document. We don't just want any document. Let's, let's add some style to it. So for this particular document, now nah, we already used this one. I want to use something that looks interesting. Just a little bit. All right, we'll use this one. I haven't used the party invitation one. So we're going to we're going to use that as our document for the Maximus. And we're going to put that in the very same um what you call it? What you call it? We're going to put it in the very same section. We only need to go here. Yeah, we're going to put it in the very same section as the document that we've been showing y'all. This should have been done already. Come on now, hurry up. It's only a, oh, that's right. It's got a, because it's got the image in it, it makes the file bigger. So I just should have went just with a regular file. So y'all hold on one second. Now, as my boy said, it only takes a minute, girl. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it only takes a minute because it's in PDF format. It's already been done. So I'm going to wait for this PDF to load up, and then I'll put that in, and I'm going to take another PDF explaining the exact same thing. People say, well, I've used that argument before. No, you've used that argument in your capacity as not one of the citizens of the state. Okay, let me see if I can explain this real quickly. When the United States was formed, remember, there was no United States. There were just the colonies. The colonies came together and they said, hey, we need to form a union. 
And so they did. They united those colonies. But they decided to refer to themselves as states. So they united their states. And then they made rules for how others could become members of those united states. So they created a compact or a corporation. And each one of you, as well as the other states, are franchises of the corporation. For lack of a better term, all government is a corporation. Now, I believe that is explained in Grisham. Um, but I will tell you, go look at the Thomas Clark Nelson file that's on the PDF section of the website. In there, Thomas Clark Nelson explains about the government and how they have documented through the Supreme Court that all government is a corporation. Watch. I'll even type that here while that file is pulling up. Okay, all government is a corporation. TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. What did I mess up? G O V R N M E N T corporate. Oh, I hit the M when I should have hit the N. Okay, all government is a corporation. All government is a corporation. Federal government corporations. Nobody asked about federal government corporations. Does anybody remember me asking about federal government corporation? Oh, 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 oh. E V E R Y. And let's do this. I should have gone into case text. That's where I should have gone into to show that to you all. Case text would have given me what I needed. Now, this is a dot com. Every government is a corporation, in the same sense that McDonald's is a corporation. See, when they start talking like that, then. Oh, look, regarding redemption gibberish, that every government is a corporation, the same as McDonald's. Nobody is talking about McDonald's. Stop that. I mean, I like, I like KRS-One, okay? I like the fact that he talked about Obama as the president of a corporation. First, every government is a corporation. It normally doesn't have to limit the limited liability structure of a corporation, mostly because... um. Yeah, I could do that, but I'm looking for the Supreme Court case law. And let me, okay, let me see if I could, let me see if I could explain to you guys why the Supreme Court would say every government is a corporation. Now, let's do this. Let's get rid of every government is a corporation. And let's do what is a corporation. There you go. That's what I want. Corporation, a company or group of people authorized to act as a single entity, legally a person, legally, not lawfully, legally a person, and recognized as such in law. Okay, so when the colonies came together, a group of people, to incorporate themselves into one entity, they became a corporation. It is just the the actual meaning of the word. We already shown you about the Washington, George Washington Corporation, the Georgetown Corporation. Wait, y'all didn't know? Well, I know many of y'all know that. Look, watch this. D C C O D E one dash one zero five. No, I didn't ask for 28. I asked for DC code. Hmm. At least I, yeah, it is 105. Okay, we'll go here. 104, since it ain't giving me 1 105, we'll go to 104 and then we'll get to 105. District of Columbia is the successor of the Corporation of Washington and Georgetown. The District of Columbia, <clears throat> pay attention. The District of Columbia is the successor of the corporations of Washington and George, George 
Washington town and all the properties of said corporations. And the county of Washington is vested in the District of Columbia. District of Columbia is a corporation, people. I didn't say this. This is the District of Columbia code. Now, if you want to make sure that this applies to the entirety of the United States, well, y'all just hold on a second there, buddy. I'm going to go ahead and show it to you. See, here is the former corporations continued for certain purposes. Okay, officers of the corporation known as the District of Columbia, the mayor of the District of Columbia and the member of the council of the District of Columbia shall be deemed and have taken as officers of such corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever they are officers, they're administrative. They are not judicial. Wait, hold on. Let's find out what the District of Columbia, why it was created. Because you need to know why the District of Columbia was created. District of Columbia was created a government by the name of the District of Columbia. The government is a corporation, like I told you. By which name it is constituted a body corporate. A body corporate for municipal purposes. Go and look at all of your states, all of your towns, all of your counties. They're created a municipal corporation, a body corporate for municipal purposes, and may contract and be contracted with, may sue and be sued, plead or be interpled, have a seal, exercise all other powers of a municipal corporation, not inconsistent with the Constitution and laws of the United States and the provisions of this code. But wait, hold on. I just need to understand, how is the District of Columbia, well, how is it set up? Hold on, let's find out. We can go to Section 1-101. The District of Columbia is the portion of the territory of the United States ceded by the states of Maryland for the permanent seat, the permanent seat, the permanent seat of government for the United States, including the River Potomac in its course through the district and the islands therein. Ladies and gentlemen, that river flows all the way to where? Does it not go into the Gulf? Does the Gulf not go into the Atlantic? Does the Atlantic not go into the Indian and Mediterranean and Black? And does it not go into the Pacific? Does it not go in? Look, rivers flows into oceans, oceans flow into oceans. So this meant that they cover, let me make sure you understand, including the River Potomac and its course through the district. Well, have you noticed that Los Angeles is a district? Washington State is a district? You didn't know? Well, go look at your school district. Go look at your water district. See, it flows in through the district. Oh, I'm sorry. Whew, I know, I, I for some of you guys, y'all don't understand. So let's do, I think it is 34. Dash. Three four zero one, and I believe it's twenty two three four zero one, but I'm not sure. So give me three four, no, two two. I think it is, but I'm not sure. This may, the District of Columbia, smallest designation, organization. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it lets you know. Want you to pay attention because you didn't understand before. No person engaged in business for collecting or aiding in the collection of private debts or obligation, i.e. the courts, or engaged in the furnishing of private police investigation or other private detective services, i.e. those private corporations known as the courts. You don't believe me? Go and look at the uh, Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act. Not the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act, the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act. Let's continue for a second. Oh, you know so much. No, I don't know nothing at all. Shall use part of the name of such business, employ any communication, correspondence, notice, advertisement, secular, or other writing or publication with the words District of Columbia. District. Anytime you see any corporation, whether it be a municipal corporation or otherwise, with the word district, 
it means the District of Columbia or the initials DC or any emblem and or insignia utilizing any of the said terms as part of its design. These are terms, these are not names. Any of the said terms, these are legal terms, people. And these legal terms, they have copywritten in such manner as reasonably to convey the impression or the belief that such business is a department, agency, or bureau of instrumentality of the municipal government of the District of Columbia, or in any manner represent the District of Columbia as used in this section and in section 223402, the word person may include, uh, means and includes individuals, association, partnerships, or corporations. What is this saying? This is letting you know that anybody who uses the term district, school district, municipal district, all of those organizations that use the word district, it means they're part of the District of Columbia. The Potomac River flows a long ways. I know, I know, I know. Don't focus on this, ladies and gentlemen. This is the District of Columbia. This is the law. Remember, they're the permanent seat of government for the United States. Congress, the president, and the judiciary are all seated in the District of Columbia. The permanent seat of government for the United States, the corporation, is in the District of Columbia. Don't let nobody tell you different because then they would have to contradict this junk right here. See, I show you what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking. I've just showed you what it says. I didn't make it say this. I'm not trying to make it say something different. By the way, I got this information from Thomas Clark Nelson by reading his material. Now, some of it I already knew, but Thomas Clark Nelson gave me the proof. See, I couldn't prove it. I just knew it. So he gave me the proof of this information. That's why I could tell you that all government is a corporation. That's why I could tell you because Thomas Clark Nelson, who I give a lot of credit to, I, there's a file on our website called Thomas Clark Nelson. His documents are there. He provides the proof. Download it. Go over it. I've already gone over the information. As you can see, not only did I go over the information, but I verified the information. Okay? That's why I can say Thomas Clark Nelson on the money. Now, the thing about the car, I think they pulled that from the internet because a lot of people were getting in trouble and he didn't want to be responsible for those individuals going out there and doing certain things because they just didn't have enough knowledge. So I believe that's why they pulled it from the internet, but I cannot be certain. Okay? I cannot be certain. All I can tell you is that I reviewed his information. Now, what I can tell you is this, as I've mentioned before, when you are and I, I because only because I mentioned the automobile no we're going to do operating a we're going to do operating a vehicle definition because we used to think it was driving a motor vehicle, but it is not driving a motor vehicle. Operating or use of a vehicle constitutes some of the elements of a DUI, but what is meant by operating a vehicle? The common definition for operation usually includes actual physical handling or manipulation of the electrical or mechanical controls of a motor vehicle, including the starting of the vehicle. Okay, when you become a vehicle operator, operator, okay, when you become a vehicle operator, you got to understand a vehicle operator is not the natural person. It is someone who has applied for a license. Any publicly owned vehicle operated by the following person agency. This section does not alter the definition for a school bus, okay? Any publicly owned vehicle operated, well, we've already had rod class. We already had rod class 
verified at the DMV, pay attention, is a privately owned corporation. And that because they keep the certificate of ownership for all vehicles, then they are the owner. And so it becomes a publicly owned vehicle. That's why you must register your publicly owned vehicle with that organization. That's why they won't give you the original ownership documents. They will only give you a certificate, which doesn't equate to ownership. So, ladies and gentlemen, every state has a Hold on. Every state has a non-operating permit. Now, California definitely has one. Okay? Because here's the thing. It's not a matter of being planning to non-operate. It is whether or not. I'm sorry. I have us plugged in. And it's only temporary because I'm not going to be turning on any generator anytime soon. So this video won't be uploaded until later. But for right now, I'm going to plug into an auxiliary supply so that I can charge up the battery and be plugged in. Okay, I didn't ask you for this, so get out of here. All right. Plan non-operation certificate, California. And let's do, let's do Missouri. No, let's do Florida. Yeah, we'll even do Florida definition. We'll see what is it in Florida. Plan non-operating uh, stands for plan non-operating, meaning you plan on storing and not operating your vehicle during the next renewal year. If you do not wish to pay registration renewal fees and you do not wish to pay registration renewal fees and you do not wish to pay registration renewal fees, subsequently, you are not required to provide liability coverage for the vehicle. Ladies and gentlemen, no, I am not telling people to drive without liability coverage, I'm not telling them to travel without liability coverage, nor am I telling them to go out there and do the plan non operating permit. What I'm telling you is that it's called operating a motor vehicle, not driving a motor vehicle. See, they have been nitpicking on words. They've been doing this for a while. We just talked about the Supreme Court and the all caps name and all of that stuff, how it's all about words. What does a non-op mean for a car? Okay, this non-op is California. And I know many of you, because I've heard the word non-op. Okay, I've heard that phrase used before. And it wasn't just in California. See? It says the department may not issue a temporary operation permit for any blah, blah, blah. Remember, a permit is when you're asking for permission. We've already showed you. Okay, I will do it one last time. Don't don't make this a habit. Hold on. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's been about 40 minutes since uh, I put the video on pause. Only because I was looking for some other things. First, I actually even pulled up this document. This is called the Lawyer's Secret Oath. Ladies and gentlemen, I've gone over part of this document. Um, there were some things that I was looking for, including the Lawyer's Secret Oath. When they talk about pro se status, yes, I don't like to be called pro se in any case. That's why you don't hear me using the word that often. I do appreciate the word sui juris, but I don't need them to describe what I'm doing. I'm exercising my right to speak on my own behalf. I don't need your permission. Now, what you guys do not know, as I've mentioned to some of you, but many of you are unaware, on appeal, the Supreme Court has stated 
that you do not have the right to represent yourself on appeal. That your right to an appeal is not a constitutional right, it's a statutory right. So I am challenging that stupidity by saying you better pay attention to the right to redress. That is to correct the wrongs done to a person. The right to redress is an appeal. It's an appeal to government to correct the wrong. Morons. This is what's going on. So, these things, when I use terms like bloodsuckers and fraud and treason and all of that, those are conclusions. And that doesn't help you. So, I will say again, do not go off of documents like this and repeat the words that they are repeating. You can use the document to gain an education, but there are a lot of statements made in documents like this that doesn't provide any proof. Go ahead. Take a look. You saw... The act of March 9th, 1933, talking about the bankruptcy, which is the so-called Gold Obligation Act. Not Gold Obligation Act, I'm sorry. That's the Emergency Banking Act. That's the Trading with the Enemies Act amendment. But the problem is they're not showing you where in the act they're getting the information they're getting it. Okay, you're going to have to do that research. Then in 1878, the American legal system came under the control of the labor union. Well, where's the proof? It's just a statement. You follow me? Okay, now I'm not criticizing. Yes, I am. I'm not criticizing the people who put this together. They talk about that 13th Amendment. It's a phantom 13th Amendment because there's no proof. Sorry. That's why they burned things down so that there would be no proof. Proof. Foof, foof, foof. Proof. No proof. Can't talk about it if you can't prove it. Lawyer, learn it in the law to advise in court. Barrister, 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 uh, I can't say the other word. That's a bad word. Advocate, one who pleads within the bar or defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, to advocate is not a word they created. But what they've done is they've taken a word and created a word that looks similar in appearance but has a different meaning. Now, the reason why I pulled this up, because this file is called Lawyer's Secret Oath. But this is page four. This is the first time they start mentioning the secret oath. But they don't mention what the secret oath is. They do speak of the Erie Railroad Tompkins case. Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. But hold on. I just need you guys to go back and understand something. This is the same information that's been parroted, parrot, like a parrot, repeating what somebody else has said, but they're not showing any proof. Like they said, Erie Railroad got rid of common law. Erie Railroad did not get rid of common law. Uh, the Supreme Court couldn't get rid of common law even if they wanted to. The Supreme Court can say whatever they want, but without authority, they have no say, okay? The idea is, and this is the idea is that they're doing things and we're not understanding the guidance and um, jurisdiction for which they're operating. They're operating from the seat of, let's see if we can um, explain it, uh, not here. Hold on. I had the right form up, but what happens is I have to pull up the right form. Because what I did is I took the Maximus. Here's one of the Maximus documents. Uh-oh, it says no. It says it ain't pulling that up, even though, oh, because I moved it. Oh, my stars. I did move it, y'all. Clerk, 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 style manual. See, Maximus. These are two Maximus documents. I named one explain when it actually doesn't really explain, explain. The so-called doctrine explains itself, but I put them in the folder. I will put them online for you all. Okay, I will do that shortly before this video is uploaded. This video is already over an hour. I don't want this right here. Oh, I wasn't supposed to be pulling this up. Oh, snap. I'm going to have to delete this one. Oh, that's right. I did delete it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, I have to delete this again. This is the document that we don't want. That's junk. You don't want that junk. That's actually a virus, okay, because it will download something. So that's got deleted immediately. And 
because I've seen that junk before. So we're going to click on this one. There are two of them. You are going to give us a virus? You better believe it. I thought you thought that COVID was something. Wait till you get this virus. Anyway, no, I wouldn't give anybody a virus. You have to open it to get that. So look, adopted in Roman law, three levels, capitalists, okay? And see, this thing talks about the registration of live birth. Now, see, as I told everybody, my registration of live birth does not have all capital letters anywhere. Okay, it just doesn't. So that's the first thing. This document explains this, but guess what it doesn't explain? It doesn't explain the capitus minia. It just says this right here. This is not enough, which is why I want you to pay attention, gentlemen and ladies. That's why we have this one. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick. Okay, that should have pulled up by now. It's uh, too much time. So let's get rid of that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we have our, I do like the fact that they do have information. This even tells you where it gets this information from. So we're going to click on that. We're going to go to that site. And while it goes to that site, for the purpose of understanding one's legal and commercial status, remember, we're, it's not status, it's capacity. Not your status. No, your status has never changed. It's your capacity. See, if you're born a royal, okay, you cannot unbecome a royal. You cannot unborn yourself. So it's not your status that changes. It's your capacity, that recognition of who you be. That's what changes. That's what you have to keep in mind. That's what you have to be mindful of. So it's the capacity. And that's what this capitus diminuto, diminutio maxima, diminutio, diminutio, diminishing, capitalized, diminishing the maximum. That's the most you can be diminished. Now, this thing shall go on to explain Black's Law Dictionary gives you the definition. These are the definitions from Black's Law Dictionary. And look at that. It gives you information you can attach to your junk to show, hey, you guys are following a stupid Roman tradition. You're following a tradition, not a law. See, pay, pay attention. They're following a Roman tradition, not a law. See, the Romans made their own civil laws for Rome, but they did not make the law for man. This is not a common law practice. This is a civil practice by civil governments. I know, I know, I know it's complicated, complicated, but it ain't that complicated. All right. Now let's talk about the licenses. It says that this site doesn't exist anymore. Took too long to respond. No, it could not have taken too long to respond. We're going to give it another opportunity. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go here so that you can understand what's going on. The defendant was convicted of unlawfully operating, unlawfully operating, unlawfully operating a motor vehicle upon the public highways. This is 1985. So, ladies and gentlemen, they said you're operating a motor vehicle. Okay, let's find out what an operation is. Copy. Man, the military performs operations all the time. Military? No, this is not a military thing. I think it is a military thing. No, it's not a military thing. It is a military. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Okay. So we're going to put it here because these are the downloads. Downloads. And we're going to go here. We're just looking for a definition. A person of a person. Control of functions of a machine, process, or a system. Perform a surgical operation. Okay, now let's do, watch this, L-E-G-A-L, -E not lawful, but legal definition, okay? A way in which someone gets certain rights. 
Whoa, a way in which someone gets certain rights. Remember, you don't need to get rights from anyone. You already have inalienable or alienable rights. Automatically under the law without taking action, requiring cooperation from another person or being subject of a court order. Operation of law can also describe what a person can and cannot do or what rights or interests a person has. Operation of law cannot control your rights, but this is operation. They're saying you're operating. Now this is operation I put in operating, okay? Legal definition for operating a motor vehicle. The law is that a person operating a motor vehicle whenever he or she is in the vehicle and intentionally manipulates some mechanical or electrical part of the vehicle, like its gears, shift, or ignition, which alone or in sequence will set the vehicle in motion. You see, that's real technical, ain't it? They just they just sat up there and got so technical. Okay, only when I am permitted. Only when I am licensed under your state. Now, why can I say that? Why can one say that they're operating a vehicle only when licensed? Let's pay attention. Operating a vehicle upon a public ways while his operator's license was suspended. Now, the county, uh oh, wrong, wrong one. I want to go, uh oh. Yep, we got to go back and back again and back again. Whew, didn't mean to get rid of that. Meant to come right here and get that spacing right there and to get that spacing right there. All right, and then get this spacing. Eventually, it don't matter. Okay, while his operator license was suspended. Okay, rendered judgment and an appeal was taken. The Court of Criminal Appeals Bachelor C held that proof that the defendant was driving an automobile while his driver's license was suspended did not sustain the allegations of the charge that he had driven while his operator's license was suspended. Judgment was reversed. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing in the state of Texas at that time of an operator's license. Go ahead. Take a look at your license. It says driver's license. It doesn't say operator's license. But notice this whole case is operator's license. The whole thing continues to say operating a motor vehicle up on a public highways while operator's license was suspended. You don't have an operator's license. There's no such thing as an operator's license. It is a driver's license. So there is no, there is in Texas no such license as a driver's license. Hmm. Automobile while his driver's license was suspended. Did not sustain the allegation of the charge that he had driven while his operator's license was suspended. See, they charged him with his driver's license being suspended. The court focused on the actual term, operator's license. So they were going by what the actual statute titled it, not what the DMV titled it. You follow me? All right, so let's get past that. We got to go to the next one. Sorry, don't care about the Texas case so much because that case is over with, said and done. We just put it in there for people to have knowledge of how licenses work. And it and the only reason why I'm doing the license thing. Oh, E. -E. <laughs> That's what I should have done. Licensee. Okay. Whew. This is the one I wanted to show you. This is why we put the video on pause in the first place. I did license and not licensee. So this is under the laws you did not know exist. It's on the website, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to pay attention. The rules are the court must have jurisdiction. It is impossible to prove jurisdiction exists absent a substantial nexus with the state, such as voluntary subscription to license and application. Did you apply to become a driver? Do you have to apply to become a driver? You have the constitutional right to travel. When cars were invented, did the government invent the car? Or was it a private party who invented the car? 
So obviously the government cannot make your owning a car or having a license for a car, they cannot regulate that. Why? Because it was created. Now they can regulate it because it became an industry, but they cannot regulate your ownership of it. You can have as many cars as you want. Well, the government says that I'm only limited. No, the government cannot limit you unless you're licensed. Pay attention. It is impossible to prove jurisdiction exists absent a substantial nexus with the state. You must have asked for a permit. That's what the state's problem is with me right now. They're expecting me to get permits for my property. I told them I'm not sitting up here trying to license with them. I'm not asking them for permission to live. That's what a permit is. Request for permission. All jurisdictional facts supporting the claim of supposed jurisdiction exists must appear on the record of the court. So with the court, when you're challenging the court's jurisdiction, what they're doing is they're saying, well, we said we have jurisdiction. And so that's a fact and that's it. No, it don't work that way. See, that's why the law says the judge must prove it has jurisdiction. Okay, where a person is not at the time a licensee, his license was suspended, so he wasn't a licensee. Neither the agency, the DMV, nor any official, the court, has any jurisdiction of said person to consider or make an order. One ground as to want of jurisdiction was the accused was not a licensee and it was not claimed that he was. Do you follow me? Now, the reason why you won't find most of these cases want you to do this. The court came up with this practice about unpublished cases. And so many of these cases are unpublished. It does not invalidate the information. Why? Because the court acts on principles of law. Okay. Now, what I want to do, this is what I want to do. I want to copy this and I want to put you guys on pause just for a second. We're going to be right back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, I am going to be bringing this video to a close. But before I did that, something came to my attention when we're going over jurisdiction. So I decided to go ahead and punch in personal jurisdiction and lack thereof, or want of jurisdiction. I'm a very, very, very big fan of want of jurisdiction. So challenging personal jurisdiction, a guide to the procedures and standards for dismissing lawsuit for lack of personal jurisdiction. Remember. When they're bringing you to trial, they're not bringing you to trial. They're bringing that straw person, that character, that creature to trial. They're not bringing you to trial, whether it be civil, whether it be criminal. So you have to challenge jurisdiction. But they have some rules. Under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, 12B2, you can move the court for dismiss due to lack of personal jurisdiction. You must do so by, a, according to them, motion. Accordingly, the motion challenging personal jurisdiction must be filed at the onset, outset of the case. Very beginning is the first thing you must do. Remember, you must challenge jurisdiction off the bat. Anybody wants to bring the lawsuit against you, the first thing you do is challenge jurisdiction. First thing. Isn't that what the document that we have, the first thing you do off the bat is challenge jurisdiction? Let's see. Hold on. Laws you did not know exist. One problem is that few people cannot recognize the difference between a court and an administrative tribunal. Then it tells you to see administrative laws. Oh, we got to go to the very top of this. It's the jurisdiction thing, the very first one. So give me a second. There we go. No, nope, not that one. Where is it? I think I may have missed it. I know that it's the the parties to amend defects in their case and everything, but I am looking for pleas from defendants shall not be dismissed due to lack of failure process. All pleadings must be as reasonable as one da, 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 further enacted. No, there is something in here where it says you must challenge jurisdiction off the bat at the onset. And I don't see that part. And I know it's in right where it says that. And I cannot tell you. Okay, let's do this. Uh, real quick, we're going to do replace, we're going to say,
All right, I'm going to put that and I'm going to find where it says it. Uh-oh. It says it don't find it that way. So now I'm going to put one, two, three. And where is you? Challenge jurisdiction. Okay, challenge jurisdiction is one of the best defenses you can make because if you use it right, the right argument, it is almost impossible for you to lose. Okay, so watch what they say. If they attempt to tell you you can't question their jurisdiction, you can easily shut them up with these court cases. Okay, there you go. There you go. Once the law, jurisdiction, administrative agency, administrative proceedings, these are all administrative proceedings, ladies and gentlemen. So they're all officers of the court. Okay, I'm looking for the challenge jurisdiction right off the bat statement because I want to show that the guys who put this in, that's what they did. Uh, oh, right off the bat. See, right off the bat. There it is, challenge jurisdiction and a motion to dismiss. You do a challenge jurisdiction and a motion to dismiss right off the bat. Now, let's see if the law agrees with that. I told you I've gone over this stuff over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Accordingly, a motion to challenge personal jurisdiction must be filed at the onset of the case. The defense lack of personal jurisdiction is waivable. It's laughable, too. They say you can waive it if you file a, an appearance. Remember, when you file a pleading or responsive pleading, then you waive your right to challenge jurisdiction. You must challenge the jurisdiction. It must be the first thing you do. So we do it in our caption. Challenge your jurisdiction, mother. Okay. By doing that, ladies and gentlemen, you stop their whole mechanism. Now, we're going to go to this right here. This says number one. It says, however, courts, we don't care about what courts have allowed. What I want you to do is pay attention to this comment right here. A corollary of the fact that personal jurisdiction is waivable is the fact that challenging personal jurisdiction is optional. In other words, unlike Issues involving lack of subject matter jurisdiction, the court cannot dismiss an action sponante on its own motion for lack of personal jurisdiction. A defendant may consent to personal jurisdiction in a particular form, even though personal jurisdiction would otherwise be not exist or be absent, except for your consent. You have to consent to personal jurisdiction. The way you do that is by filing pleadings in a case. That's how you consent. Like I said, all of you are in these cases in courts because you consent. Challenge jurisdiction right off the bat. Personal jurisdiction, you don't even have to say, I challenge every aspect of jurisdiction in this matter. Although that is optional, challenging or not challenging jurisdiction presents strategic opportunities. While a defendant may have grounds to challenge personal jurisdiction in a particular case, the defendant should consider whether the form chosen by the plaintiff confers a strategic advantage related or relative to the form where the personal jurisdiction would be proper. Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and do this so that you can understand this. Now, I would go over this document. This will be on the website. We'll put it under, we'll just put it under PDFs. No, no, we'll put it under release dismissal. So it'll be in a release dismissal folder. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on, everyone. We're going to do it right now. Oh, the clerk style manual? The clerk style manual, the clerk style manual is on the website. I know I downloaded this already. Let's do it again because I didn't see it there. One second. So the clerk style manual and all the documents in the clerk style manual is in on the website under the PDF section, clerk style manual. So it is there. This is in download. So, oh, it's in the clerk style manual. Ladies and gentlemen, no. Well, we're not going to keep it. It's in the clerk's. I put it in the clerk style manual folder because that's for my downloads at this time. That's the default folder. However, we're going to put it in the motion. Let's go to the website. This is the website, ladies and gentlemen. And we said we're going to put it in the release dismissal folder. So release dismissal complaint folder. That's where it will go. And so challenging jurisdiction. Let's do it this way. So I'll make sure. And what I do is, since this is that particular folder, it will be up in a second. Up, up, and away. Come on. 
Come on, come on, come on. Okay, it's putting it in the folder now as we speak. So that's being done. So I will go over this document, those of you who got cases, who the courts are getting ready to file a lawsuit against you. We want to make sure that the court has jurisdiction. So they're going to be coming after the entity. They have to go after the entity. They can't come after you. You're not there to stand surety as the entity. You're going to have to figure out that argument. I can't do that argument right now. I'm working on too many things. I'm sorry. Cannot do that. But you can figure it out with this document right here. For instance, while the defendant may have grounds to challenge personal jurisdiction in a particular case, the defendant should consider whether, see, complete. The transfer is complete. An example, the defendant may consider the reputation advantages of the form. And the form may be benefit blah, blah, blah. substantial laws of the plaintiff's chosen form may have a cap on damages. Don't care about all of that. Okay. The federal court in a diversity action may assume jurisdiction over non-resident defendants only to the extent permitted by the alarm or statute of the form state by due process clause of the 14th Amendment. We don't care about no due process clause in the 14th Amendment. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I will go over. These attorneys that have put this together are explaining to you their strategy, how they get rid of specific jurisdiction issues. They put in the case law. I'm going in because there's one case law I need because the argument, and there's no such thing as general jurisdiction. Okay. There is no such thing as general jurisdiction. It does not exist anywhere. It says general jurisdiction refers to a court's ability to exercise personal jurisdiction over any and all claims against the defendant, regardless of the relationship between the defendant's contract with the form and the subject of the action. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as general jurisdiction. General jurisdiction means they have jurisdiction over everything. Sorry, that is an administrative term that is not a lawful term see there is something between administrative and legal the reason why the courts could never have general jurisdiction because there was no authorization for general jurisdiction within the framework of the constitution go back and take a look it says original jurisdiction does not say general okay they don't get general jurisdiction over everything because some things they have no jurisdiction over these are the case laws associated with the information that the gentlemen are mentioning. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two documents, and then we're going to get back to that non-operating permit junk, but we're talking about jurisdiction. So in our document for our complaint against officers of the court and other officers, we are bringing up this information. But what we're doing is a little bit different than what you will see other people doing. We are taking what the courts have stated are facts. Let's show you. Bring you down right about there. Okay. The fact that if the court determines that there is no genuine dispute as to the facts given rise to jurisdiction, the defendant is not entitled to a jury determination on the issue. So that won't be in here. Okay. That won't be in here. So let's go. That's not a fact. That's an opinion. Because your rights, they don't get to determine. If the court determines that there is no sufficient evidence of jurisdiction of a matter to go to the jury, the court must dismiss the charges. See, that's why the other one is inconsequential. The other one doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because I want you to pay attention. The reason why it doesn't matter is because the court cannot proceed if there is no evidence of jurisdiction. It doesn't have the right. It doesn't have the jurisdiction. It must dismiss the charges. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the court submit, submits it to a jury or not. It doesn't matter. The court doesn't have that right. Okay? So we're challenging the court's jurisdiction. We're saying you don't have any jurisdiction over us, the natural person. You don't have any jurisdiction over us, the state citizen. We haven't consented to your jurisdiction. Um, let's see. Sorry, this uh, right here. TikTok. TikTok. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to, I think this is about, I don't think it's 12. We have to change this. No, we'll, we'll go to 12 and then we'll figure out what the font is for the other one. Okay, and then we'll go here and your Arial. Okay, and it's 12. So the only thing I have to do is change the name of the font. And it will already be the right one. So now I have to go back to the A's. And the A's have it. There it was right there, and I missed it. There we go. Okay, now everything's the same font. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have this document up shortly. Now, at the end of this video, as with most of my videos, I made mention of the new SAP packs. And the previous SAP packers are now demanding that somebody respond to them, even though I told them, do not ask us for anything right now. We will be taking care of you, but because we haven't promised certain things to people, then it wasn't going to be delegated to them upon their demands that they were going to have to wait a little bit more patiently until we got around. Because we hadn't promised these things, we said that we would be adding certain things to their SAT Act. You're not grandfathered in automatically with the new provisions. It doesn't work that way. So, I, I don't know why people are the way that they are. I don't know what makes people think that they're entitled to everything. I, that, that's disturbing to me. And so, what I, when I make mention as the president of the organization, I make mention of it to you all in this sense. We will not be dictated to by anybody. You will not control what we do as an organization. What we do as an organization is done for the benefit of, again, our clients. That's who we're there for. We're there for the benefit of our clients. We're there to help our clients. We're not there to, we're not there to respond to demands from our clients. Our clients are not our rulers. Our clients come first, and they do come first. We don't put anything else ahead of them. That is the policy that will remain the policy forever for the organization. But our clients do not get to rule over us. They don't get to dictate how we do our business. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but we do have some clients that are overly insistent, and they don't understand how business actually works. No business works that way. You don't get to command any business to do anything. With regards to each of the SAP packers, SACOM has fulfilled this obligation. Now, there are some people who have not received the 98 series number, and we've explained that that was measures out of our control. And there's a provision in the agreement for that. However, we will say this, and I will put up a video subsequent to this, that if individuals have not received something that they were assured they were received by SACOM, please email us and let us know. We will respond to you. We will let you know. We will check our files. And if it's a problem with emails, because we have had a lot of problems with emails, and the reason why we've had a lot of problems with emails is because apparently the information that I'm putting out is um, not appreciated. Don't know why, because I'm not showing anybody anything that's not already out there. Everything that I'm showing you is already out there in the public. So how could somebody disagree with the information that's already out there in the public? I find that to be amazing, but that's been the case. And so we've had some issues regarding the information that's out there in the public. So with that being said, um, this was the first article that pulled up on challenging jurisdiction because I did the federal one. There's a criminal challenge to jurisdiction that's in the uh, complaint against corporate officials and uh, judicial officials and government corporate officials is what I should be saying. Okay, so I want to I want to find another PDF. Now, I do like the due process limits on the jurisdiction of the court, but that's not going to be the issue. That's not going to be what the conversation is. 
okay, this is a case where an individual was challenging the court's jurisdiction and doing a petition for writ of certiorari. That's what this case is. I did pull that up. Um, what I'm going to suggest all of you do. Oh, look at that. Los Angeles County. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to suggest all of you do for a certain fact is do your research on jurisdiction. Do your research on your capacity. Do your research on that name that was created. That's a creature of the state. Your issue is with the state. The state owns that. I'm only the beneficiary of that account. I am not the surety for that account. I don't mind having that conversation. I need you to prove that I'm the surety. Okay? I need you to prove that I'm the surety. Um, hold on. It says, for instance, persons adversely affected by a law cannot challenge its... Whoa, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean a person adversely affected by a law can't challenge its legality, its constitutionality? I know that that's what they're going to say, and I know better. Uh, you're the main person who can challenge the constitutionality of the statute is because you're directly affected thereby. See, a person who's not affected by something cannot challenge it. See, I can't just go and just start challenging everything just because I don't like it. Now, again, remember I told you about due process clause, all persons born? Well, nobody was born in the United States. Go take a look. Nobody's birth certificate says that they were born in the United States. You don't believe me? Go take a look at your birth certificate. It says that you were born in the state of, not in the United States, and your state is a sovereign state. Interesting, huh? Yes. So you don't qualify as a United States citizen. However, the people who are naturalized citizens are born in the United States. Interesting, ain't it? I don't know. Let's do, hold on. Let's do J-U-R-I-S-D-I-C-T-I-O-N. I put jurisdiction challenge, and there are 28 instances of the two words. Oh, no, just, uh, sorry. I can't. There's no instance of the two words. It's just jurisdiction. In this document, there is... I put personal jurisdiction, so I'm going to see what we got. There are five instances of personal jurisdiction. Generally, presence within the state is sufficient to create personal jurisdiction over an individual if process is served. Pay attention. Just the presence in a state, they say, is sufficient, but that's generally. That means that there is an exception to that rule. Pay attention to the word generally. Whenever you see the word generally, there is an exception to the rule. How jurisdiction is determined depends on the nature of the suit being brought. If a dispute is directed against a person, not property, the proceedings are considered in persona, and jurisdiction may be established over the defendant's person in order to render an, effect, an effective decree. Ladies and gentlemen, who's the defendant? Now the defendant has to be properly identified. Again, exceptions to the rule. Now, hold on. However, if the defendant, although technically domiciled there, has left the state with no intention to return, service by publication as compared to a summons left at his last or unusual place of abode, <laughs> is where his family continue to reside, is inadequate because it is not reasonably calculated to give actual notice of the proceedings and opportunity to be heard. Yeah, due process requires an opportunity to be heard. All right, let's go to the next one. Don't see it. Uh-oh, there it is. In which the court held that California could not obtain personal jurisdiction over a New York resident whose sole relevant contact with the state was to send his daughter to live with her mother in California. There you go. 
the long arm of the state doesn't go that route, that, that, that far. It doesn't stretch that far. It would be a mistake to assume that the trend to expand the reach of the state's courts herald the eventual demise of all restrictions on personal jurisdiction of the state court. Nobody cares. And as a result, California and Bristol Myers, scrub, scrub, corporation versus Superior Court, concluded that the California Supreme Court erred when employing the relaxed approach to personal jurisdiction by holding that the state court could exercise specific jurisdiction over a corporate defendant who was being sued in another state by another state residence for an out-of-state activity solely because the defendant had extensive forum contracts unrelated to the claims in question. Okay, nobody cares. Okay, the rule has been strongly criticized but persists. Uh, what rule? It's called the transient rule of personal jurisdiction. The power myth of form can be used. Uh, but the court held that service of process on a non-resident physical presence within a state satisfied due process regardless of the duration or purpose of the non-resident visit. See, basically, if the non-resident, if he's not a resident of the state, and just because he visits the state, they serve process on him, the person was claiming, hey, I ain't a resident of this state. You can't serve me. You have to serve me at my place of residence. That was the argument in court. And it was a valid argument because that is the process of service rule. But they are claiming it was personal service upon the individual at a place he's known to frequent, but he's not known to frequent that place. Do you follow me? That's the technicalities. There's always going to be, generally, there's always a technicality to the rule. Always. Okay, we're not going to travel too much further down this rabbit hole. And it is a rabbit hole because then there are so many different aspects of it when it comes to jurisdiction. We're going to provide what we can provide, give you the information that we can give you, and hope that you can do the best you can with the information that's provided. Have a good day, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.